Good evening, everyone. Please give another warm thank you to Mahakit Lerd Shivanan, our musician for the evening. My name is Anita Zaidi, and I'm the president of the Gender Equality Division at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm so thrilled to be here to share with you what I promise you will be a powerful and inspiring evening of personal stories. I truly believe in the power of storytelling. Stories are such an extraordinary tool for change, especially for advancing gender equality and for breaking through barriers that exist for family planning in many, many of the countries that we work in. As a lifelong advocate for women and girls, I know, although I love facts and figures, for many people, the best way to change hearts and minds is through the power of stories. At the foundation, one of the most important things we can do is listen and learn. Listen and learn from women directly about their needs when it comes to health and family planning. That is why we are so proud to support MOTH. MOTH is a nonprofit, a global arts organization dedicated to building empathy and compassion through personal narrative. The MOTH was founded on a simple yet profound and ancient idea to create a shared space where friends could tell and listen to great stories from each other. The moth shares my deep belief in supporting women to tell and own their own stories. Through stories, we can challenge dominant narratives, deepen connections, and create a more productive dialogue around the world, perhaps even create harmony. In a few moments, you'll hear from three exceptional storytellers. All our activists who are working hard to advocate for a gender equal world. One where women and girls can have agency over their bodies and their lives and are free to make their own choices. Each storyteller will stand before you in front of a microphone to share something deeply personal about themselves. That is, an exceptional act of courage. It's one that allows us to connect with one another and perhaps most important of all, to listen with an open mind. So tonight we celebrate and we elevate stories of choice and the transformative power of family planning. Thank you for being here and sharing in this experience. And now, Please join me in welcoming your host for the evening, social activist and media personality, Adele Onyango. Adele. Thank you so much. Let's have another warm round of applause for Anita Zaidi and her passion for storytelling. And another warm round of applause for our exceptional musician tonight, Mark Kidd, who's already done such a fantastic job. As mentioned, my, my name is Adele Onyango, and I'll be your host this evening. And I'd love to welcome you all to the moth. So give yourselves a warm round of applause for being here this evening and really believing in the power of storytelling. Um, so we're really excited to be here with you at ICFP to celebrate agency, to celebrate choice, and to also have conversations around access to family planning. And just as Anita said, sometimes you can get lost in the numbers and the statistics, and you may forget that there are stories behind all of those, and that's where the moth comes in. Personal stories are very important when it comes to family planning. They help us create conversation, they help us create connections, and this is what we're all about here at The Moth. And I really hope that so far in this wonderful conference that you too have been sharing your own stories to really connect with the issue when we're talking about family planning for all. 
So today's mock main stage, whose theme is Voices Carry Stories of Strength, as Anita said, will showcase three storytellers who are all graduates of the MOTS Global Community Program. But before we start, I'd like to ask you to please turn off all your cell phones. I'll give you two seconds to do that. Um, not silent, all the way off. I'm not trying to just disconnect you from everyone so that you can 100% connect to the stories. But we're also um, recording tonight's storytellers to be able to broadcast these stories with the rest of the world. And, you know, your cell phones could distort our recording. So just kindly turn them all the way off. I'd also like to state that kindly let there be no flash photography. Um, as you listen to the stories tonight, they're definitely going to move you. And afterwards, when you do turn on your phones <laughs> at the very end, Feel free to post to social media. What have you connected with in the stories? Have they taught you something about yourself? Have they sparked um, some activism in you when it comes to family planning and the issues around that? Share those on social media and include the hashtag ICFP2022 and FP for all. Make sure you tag us as well. We're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Just search The Moth. And on Instagram, we're at Moth Stories. So by round of applause, I really want to know who here has heard of the Moth before? Ooh, that's a good number. That's a good number. And another round of applause if you're absolutely new to the Moth. Welcome, welcome. It's always great to have new people in the family. Yes, you're now automatically part of the family. And the moth is all about telling and sharing true personal stories. We are 25 years old now. Full on grown up, right? And at this point, over 50,000 stories have been told on stages like this at the moth since our inception. We truly believe that true personal stories can bridge divides, they can spark empathy amongst our listeners around the world. So if you're new to The Moth, you can go online and listen to The Moth Radio Hour and The Moth Podcast. By the way, our podcast has been downloaded over 100 million times annually. That is a huge number. And after this, we're going to cross that number because I'm sure you all will start downloading and subscribing. Now, as I mentioned earlier before, our three storytellers tonight are all graduates of the MOTS Global Community Program. And this is where we teach the art and craft of MOTS style storytelling. I actually are a graduate of the story, um, storytelling workshop. I first heard of the MOTH through an organization I was working with that was affiliated to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they sent me this email and they, it had things, the moth, and I was like, what have moths got to do with this? And then it was storytelling. I was like, what's going on here? But I was intrigued. So I applied to be part of the workshop. And I did this while being fully employed as a radio presenter in Kenya and having one leave day left yet I needed seven days free. So I knew I had to get a bit creative. And what I did is consult a family member. You know how in every family, there's that one person you go to because they're pretty street smart and they know their way around things? Mine is Auntie Jane. And so I explained to her, I really wanna to go to this workshop. I have one leave day, but if you get me a doctor's note, perhaps I could get seven days. And so that's what we did. And I ended up having the most transformative seven days of my life. I worked on a story that not only helped me navigate grieving my mom, but also opened up the world of storytelling to me. I understood the power of storytelling. I made friends in the workshop because through our stories, we saw ourselves in each other's human journeys. And it really inspired me to the extent that a couple of months after recovering from my sick leave, I handed in my resignation at work and I started a podcast called Legally Clueless that is dedicated to amplifying 
African stories. And so I consider myself, whether they like me or not, part of the Moth family, <laughs> just because of how much impact they've had in transforming my life through the power of storytelling. So if you're new to this, welcome again, and I'll give you a few notes on how the Moth works. The stories are told live, Without notes, I'm the only one who's allowed to cheat, finally. Um, and so it's not stand-up, it's not a lecture, they're true personal stories. So there's no reading aloud. Each storyteller has about eight minutes to tell their story. And Maha Kid is going to be our wonderful, sweet-sounding timekeeper. So when the storyteller is approaching the eight minute mark, they will need a bit of a reminder from Markid, so he will play this. Nice and sweet, but sometimes, you know, you're in your story and you just keep going and you just keep going, so we need to switch it up. So if they pass the eight minute mark, Markid will play. Yeah, and that should do it. So, the storyteller's bios are in the event programs that are on your tables, so you can read up and get to know more about them. But by way of introduction, I had a very interesting question to ask each of our storytellers. So when I asked our first storyteller, what is your superpower? She answered, she can escape from every minor catastrophe. So if you have a flat tire, you need to call her. Please welcome on stage, Jasmine Kirk. I am a historian, and while I was studying history, I absolutely loved it. I was spending my time digging around in archives for context clues for these massive historical events. I was debating with my instructors and with my peers about these events that were going on at the time. And I felt so fulfilled by this education. While I was there, I had the opportunity to study the history of midwifery. And I learned about how midwifery is the second oldest profession, nine months after the first. I learned about how it's the history of medical paternalism, how it's the history of women's bodies and control and who controlled their bodies. And it's the history of patriarchy. It's also the history of women helping women and uplifting other women and educating other women. Once I finished my degree, as every North American millennial liberal arts graduate does, I tried to get a job. I ended up working in a call center, selling television and internet services over the phone. And while I was in this open plan office, surrounded by a team of Mandarin speakers, I don't speak Mandarin, I felt very, very, very disconnected from the world around me. I was watching the 24-hour news cycles on screens all around, and that year I watched terrorism attacks in Europe. I watched earthquakes in Nepal. I watched the killings of unarmed black people in the United States. And I watched a young Syrian boy wash up on a beach in the Mediterranean. And like so many others, that young Syrian boy sparked something in me. I decided that I had to do something. I had to stop observing and become a part of this history that was going on all around me. So I bought a ticket to Greece and tried my best to do anything that I could to help while I was there. I ended up connecting with a women's group that helped to uplift women out of domestic violence situations. They encouraged women to come along to their knitting circles and, and their arts groups so that they could then find out what was really happening for them at home. They assisted with breastfeeding and they helped to support pregnant women and gave them the tools that they needed to look after their families and to uplift their families out of poverty and out of illness. And I really saw how midwifery could be used for activism. 
it sparked something in me again. And I was a little bit lost. I spent a few years with them, but I knew that I couldn't stay forever. I, I had nothing to offer. And so I started looking around for a new opportunity. So I Googled midwifery, English, and now I live in Australia. <laughs> When I first began my midwifery degree, I absolutely hated it. My instructors were burnt out practitioners who had no desire to connect with the next generation. I was learning pharmacology and biology and anatomy and physiology and none of it was the beautiful artistic understanding of human behavior that I had experienced before. I was ready to quit, so I decided to wait for my first day in the hospital, which happened about five weeks into the program. On that first day, we all, there was 10 of us, and we all went in for our orientation, wearing our purple uniforms, following a tiny midwife around as she gave us a tour of the hospital. That first day was terrible. I did fire safety, I did paperwork and more paperwork. I found out all of the authorities that I would have to answer to as a lowly student practitioner at the bottom of this whole train. Um, and I was pretty sure that that was it. I was going home. At the end of the day, she led us into a room and said, would you like to see a placenta? I had never seen a placenta, but it wasn't a piece of paper, so I said, yes, I would love to see a placenta. I didn't know what it would do. I thought that maybe it would explode or, or hurt me in some way, and so I put on a surgical hood, I put on goggles, I put on a mask. Nobody was wearing masks. I put on a full plastic apron. I had little booties for my shoes. I had gloves, and I walked up to this steel table with a piece of moonlight just glittering on it. They don't tell you how shiny placentas are. They don't tell you how they smell. They smell like a little bit salty like blood, but mostly they smell sweet, like amniotic fluid. This placenta was kept because it was interesting. It had a, an interesting cord insertion. Rather than going up through the middle like a balloon, it went up through the side like a drawing of a tree. It was healthy, it was thick and soft, and it was still warm, it was fresh. And that strange temperature, half a degree lower than body temperature, is just such a soothing feeling. I realized that this placenta is history. It's the history of a pregnancy, of a relationship between a parent and a child that can never be replicated. It's the history of a choice, to keep this pregnancy going. It's the history of many choices to keep it healthy and to maintain it for the entire pregnancy. And so I realized that once I decided it wasn't going to explode, I realized that I wanted to see more of them. And I stayed, and I am still a historian, but now I am also a midwife. Thank you. Please give Jasmine another warm round of applause. That was so beautiful, so artistic, so poetic. Um, and, and for some of us who've never seen a placenta, who also would think it would explode, it's, it's really great to hear um, stories around birth that are not scary and are not told to scare us away. Um, so that's beautiful, Jasmine. You know, when I was asked to host this moth um, at ICFP, I thought, okay, so why me? I have no kids, family planning, I don't have a story. And then I remembered some very nonsensical words that I was told when I was 15 years old. He said, don't hug boys. That will lead to them getting uncontrollable urges. And these words were spoken by Mr. Kimweli. He was the head of the IB program 
at St. Mary's School in Nairobi. It's also commonly referred to as Saints, and a very prestigious school known for its show-stopping musicals, for its remarkable rugby team, and alumni like the former president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta. And Saints is a boys only school from class one to form four. But in IB, they let girls in. So at any one point in time, there's about 40 girls in a sea of boys. So I was about 15 years old when I joined Saints. My mom thought I was too young to go directly to university, so IB it was. And to be honest, I, I really didn't want to join Saints. I was so scared. I'd heard such horror stories about how the boys would bully the girls. In fact, one story that really terrified me was how the high school boys would hold up signs with numbers on them. Whenever the female students would walk by, they were rating the girls. So even though I was 15 years old and at that age where boys are not disgusting anymore, we're kind of intrigued by them, I still was very scared about joining Saints. The first few weeks in the school were interesting. For the girls, we looked for ways to spice up our hideous blue uniforms. So we would shorten our skirts and tie our sweaters around our waists. And for me specifically, I would add huge earrings and loud bangles. Accessorize. And for the boys, they would try their level best to show whatever little muscle they had. And speaking of muscle, two weeks into Saints, I got into a relationship. His name was Jonah. He was tall, dark, handsome, and had the broadest shoulders this 15-year-old had ever seen. He was top of his class. He was a school prefect. He played the violin and he played rugby. So I thought I'd lucked out. He was great on paper, and by dating a prefix, I got intel on when there were gonna be spot checks, and even better, before those spot checks, he would hide my cell phone for me, which I thought was so romantic. In our second term, our head girl got pregnant, and the news began in the morning as some rumors, and speaking of intel, I found out through Jonna. But by break time, I'm pretty sure even the kids in class one knew what was happening because the school was in a panic. And so step one was for them to call an urgent meeting for all of us in IB. And we were summoned into this classroom. And I remember walking in and seeing all the teachers present, including the art teacher who never even used to attend assembly. So I knew this was serious. And Mr. Kimweli walked in and stated, I'm sure you've all heard the news. And one class clown said, no, we haven't. Why don't you repeat it? And we all chuckled. I couldn't understand why the school was panicking because we all knew how one got pregnant, so we knew how not to get pregnant. Mr. Kimweli said we would have to be very careful in how we interact with each other. So the first announcement was that girls were not allowed to hug boys. He said anyone caught doing this would get detention. He said that girls hugging boys leads to the boys having uncontrollable urges. I immediately looked at Jonna. First I was wondering, what are we gonna do without our hugs? And what are these urges that come from hugs? I've never heard of this before. The second announcement was that Bangles and earrings were outlawed. This was now sounding a little too personal. First, no hugs, now no accessories. And what did accessories have to do with getting pregnant? The last announcement was that we would be required every week to watch these really graphic videos that showed us exactly what each STD looks like. And with that, the meeting was over. So I thought about these announcements the whole day. I was very confused, I was very baffled, and then I got terribly angry. And I decided that my accessories would remain. 
So over the next couple of weeks, Jonah and I found ways around the laws. And so we would have morning hugs because not all the teachers were there and so it was safer. Other couples found abandoned classrooms, bathrooms, and we made do. What the school also decided, do it, decided to do was make the head girl who was pregnant come and give us talks, warning us, the girls, about choosing the path that she'd taken. So what they ultimately did was wrap her in a veil of shame and parade her around the school um, as a cautionary tale. But yet we didn't get any talks from the boy who had impregnated her, yet he was a saint's alumni. One morning after an assembly where I wore long pink earrings and the loudest bangles ever, the jig was up. I was called to the staff room by a teacher for defying the new rules. When I walked into the staff room, which I'd never been in before, and you only got to the staff room if you were in trouble, there were a couple of teachers in and they turned to look at who came in, um, either because they were wondering what did this student do wrong or the sound from my bangles <laughs> confused them. And I made my way to the teacher who had summoned me. And she sternly asked me, why was I still wearing earrings and bangles? I was very scared. I'd never been to the staff room. And I really didn't want to go back home with a detention slip. And so I decided I needed to ask her some questions. And I asked her, were saints proud of the men they were grooming? Were the men they were grooming, once they joined the workforce, going to ask their female workmates to remove their jewelry because of urges? Were they proud of grooming men who were absolved of all accountability? Why was the pregnant head girl giving us talks? Why hadn't we received any talks from the boy who had impregnated her? And then I, stand, I stood there my hands trembling a bit, and the teacher was silent. Between us was a thick cloud of silence, and the more it kept going, the more I thought perhaps I should just remove these earrings, take off these bangles, and leave without a detention slip. I was panicking. But after a while, she sternly told me to get out. And so I scrambled to the door, relieved that I didn't get detention, but a bit disappointed that she didn't answer my questions. You see, I grew up in a home where we were encouraged to question things, to ask why, to speak our minds. And so I wanted to know why was the conversation on sex, on pregnancy, on family planning, only targeting the girls? Why did we, the girls, have to change so much? But that wasn't the case for the boys. That happened to me when I was 15 years old. I'm now 33. I still wear big earrings, loud bangles, and I also still make sure that I ask anytime I see conversations on family planning that are not rooted in honesty, that are rooted in fear, and that are not inclusive of all parties. Why? Thank you. So when I asked our next storyteller, what is your superpower? She answered her level of commitment. When she sets her mind on doing something, it gets done. Please welcome on stage, Roxana Dost Muhammad. I belong to uh, Baloch community. It is uh, a backward area, one of the province of Pakistan, where the midwifery profession has very low status and due to the lack of uh, proper, and, uh, uh, proper guidance and uh, awareness. And the community did not give the respect to the midwife because 
the people perception is that the midwife is help the woman during labor and cleans her house after the labor and massage post labor and washes washes her uh, bloody clothes and that's it she is paid very little for all these services and occasionally she is paid by some fruits some vegetables eggs and cereals not to buy money i realized this when i giving birth of my first baby there were many women uh facing their unconditional pain along with me in civil hospital labor room i saw there many midwives they were they were work for the mothers who are in pain and i facing all the type of pain they were nearly relate to death and i was shouting not to bear the pain but the midwife was encouraged me and upgrading myself during my labor pain she help me by body massaging and to take deep breathing exercises and walk around and make some different position which help me to bear that massive pain and she made my birth of son with great skills not enough when i discharged she gave me a lot of information about my health such as about my nutrition about uh, my exercises stitch care and my baby vaccination and as well as family planning she told me about the family planning that many things and she advised me that you should make a plan for your family and onwards its work after my child birth i did not able to forget her caring her loving her sincerity and i was thinking at that time that she is she has so deep knowledge about the labor and she has so great skills how to deliver the baby and i also thinking why the people did not respect her actually she deserve i was impressed and i decided to want to be a midwife and at that stage i know that my family did not like this profession uh i miss start discussion with my family members that midwives such a blessing for the woman when the woman giving birth and she have a skill but the my family did not respond to me as i want one day we all are gathered uh, at for dinner at the dining table and uh, i was thinking that just the this is the time to you should walk you should talk about your uh, dream uh, so uh, i take my step from there that uh, i i talk that i want to be a midwife everyone look at me at surprise why she told and uh, why she could this so my the brother in law 
look at me and say aha asulaha nana khandana tikas dai jo mani kappa means this no and never our culture did not allow to women to go outside i was very disappointed at that time but by the time i strongly disagreed the culture hindrance that day i was working in kitchen and my elder brother in law came to me and loudly asked for me niyant ka se khulle paas ki dais jod mare ve mean that what are you telling everyone that you want to be i mean by uh so i scared at that time but i i confidently say yes because i decided that i want to be a midwife in any way he become more anxious and violently said to me that agar ni midwife jod mahsoos nana urati ne jaga fak pesh to mana na uragan aur na khwapana ki nana society na niya makhe okay mean is this if you want to be a midwife you have no place in our house you get out from our house because we did not want the society make fun of us i was very upset and very disappointed and i was crying at that time so i was shifted to my father's home along with my baby with broken heart but never give up the hope i started my journey from there i face a lot of problems i have a single chance at that time to get admission in the midwifery school because at that time the next year it was banned for the married women i much worried about my baby because he has 6 month old that was on breastfeed my mother was very supporting at that time she told me don't worry i take care of your baby you can go for training so i shift shifted hostel and and at that time my mind is divided in my training or in my baby all the time i was thinking about him because i'm a mother that i thinking that is my baby sleeping is my baby is hungry is my baby is crying is my baby is searching me where is my mom i mentally disturbed at that time even not even unable to continue my study but i had a will power it makes to happen because i encouraged myself to do whatever you want ruksana and then because at that time i had lost everything my close relations my respect my dignity and more and at the at, at the beginning all the night i was crying and early morning i get and ready for to, to going taking the class and the passage of time i remembered it was the end of my graduation 
uh, once i was back to came back to my hostel after my duty and the ga the uh, gatekeeper the watchman came to me and said to me that one uh, one is waiting for you on outside and they wants to meet with you i went outside and i saw that my brother in law was there i was shocked my heart was beating fast i was thinking at that, at that time why he is here suddenly he said ruksana kana zaife labor room athi nani na madad na zarurat hai mean this my wife is in labor room we need your help i remember those days when they did not permit me for same job how much they disappointed me how much they deserted me but i was that time i was a midwife and i remember my oath equally treatment for all so i agreed i say where is she and i walk with him after 5 minutes i reach there when i enter into the labor room i saw there are many women were their labor pain and some are laying on the bed and some are walked around i rushed to my own client i looked she she looked very exhausted her lips were dry i regards her and i ensure her by my sympathetic words i give her a sip of water for energy and i assist her condition oh it's breach which is one of the complicated delivery i was feeling nervous because the client is one of my very close relative and secondly i was trainee at that time and my clinical instructors standing along with me and they observed me allah give me strength finally she gave birth a male baby without any complication and i after that i feel relaxed and comfortable and take a deep breath my mother in law also there and she congratulated me for uh, to conduct the delivery and praised me after few moments my brother in law came to me and said oh rukhsana nani maaf kis nani galti mat sune means this that i'm sorry rukhsana for each and everything what i did his eyes were filling with tears and feeling his self guilty and he wished to that her daughter to make a midwife finally i completed my training with highest marks in my province and after that on graduation my family my in-laws my cousins they all are there they are stand up and clapping for me and also congratulates me and after that i serve for my people i work on about the acceptance and awareness about the midwifery profession in these days my son is 22 years old my sisters my sister in laws my cousins they all are midwife <sighs> i 
it has been my honor to change the perceptions of midwife and midwifery profession not only in, only in my society but around the world thank you Thank you so much, Roxana. Please give her another warm round of applause. Your story speaks to connectedness, to sisterhood, to womanhood, and it's so powerful to hear how you being that committed just changed the lives for so many women and the other women that they help. Um, so your superpower really is, when you put your mind to it, you get it done. Uh, but speaking of superpowers, we haven't heard <laughs> your voice. We've had the lovely tunes that you play. And so I really want to know, Mahakid, what is your superpower? My superpower? I think my superpower is I always uh, pick the slowest line when it comes to like airport security check. <laughs> <laughs> that is a superpower, superpower I'm so thankful I do not have. My superpower is I can fall asleep anywhere, anytime. Just say go and I'm gone. Um, so we only have one more storyteller, but before she comes up on stage, I would love to thank a couple of people for making this wonderful show possible. And tonight's show is directed by Sarah Austin Jeunes and produced by Ignacia Delgado. Such a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, we also have a few other people to uh, thank, but I kindly ask that you hold your applause at the very end. Uh, first is our musician who's done a fantastic job, Ma Kid. Um, we're so glad you could be here with us today. Christina Sherelle, Kelly Wellborn, Anastasia Pierron, uh, Matt Matassa, Molly Musna, Darby Major, and everybody at I ICFP. We'd also like to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting the MOTS Global Community Program and for making this event possible, especially Anita Zaidi, Fatima Riaz, Lipi Doshi, who even joined us for our rehearsals, um, Andrea Vaught, Francis Hawking, and Alice Westerman. We also want to thank Sarah Haberman, who's the MOTS Executive Director. And last but definitely not least, all of today's storyteller. Let's give all those people a warm, hearty round of applause. Now, when I asked our final storyteller, what is her superpower? She answered, the ability to procrastinate and still get things done. Please welcome Suzanne Mwini. the only girl in a family of six children. I'm seated across my mom in our tiny, partially lit living area in Kibera, Nairobi, Kenya. And I ask her, Mom, why do you have six children? And she said, because your father and I were trying to get a baby girl. And I asked, Mom, then why is it after you gave birth to me, you did not stop there. And she said, because children are a blessing from God, and we accept the number that God gives to us. And I said, Mom, this is hard to say, and probably you did not expect it. But I have no desires whatsoever to get married, or have children. Shocked, especially this coming from our only daughter, she asked, why don't you wish to have children? And I said, mom, it is my decision and I'm taking care of my siblings and the girls I work with at the community. And I also want to enjoy 
my time independently and freely. Years later, I'm out of high school, and my, my mom reminds me, Susan, I hope you'll eventually change your mind, because children are important, and every woman must have her own children. Well, I'm out of high school, and I jump straight into the dating pool, kissing a few frogs here and there. Of course, I'm human. I may not desire marriage or children, but the feeling for companionship is there. During my escapades, I meet my Prince Charming, my ideal type of a perfect man. Stunning looks, amazing personality, great sense of humor and style, always including me on his plans, both present and future. The most patient, intentional, and loving man. He'd buy me flowers, take me out on dinner dates, and vacations. And I remember this one Thursday, he called, and he was like, babe, what are your plans for the weekend? And I said, you are my plans. And he said, well, then start packing. We're going to the coast to spend our weekend there. Excited, I said, I will not forget to also pack the condoms, because you might forget. It was a lovely weekend. However, despite all the affection, two voices inside my head were always at war. One voice telling me to share with him about my decision of not wanting married and not wanting kids. Another voice telling me, if I share with him, then I lose him. Because while my, my, while my end goal of the relationship was only companionship without much of the marriage formalities and children, his goal was to marry and start a family. Days passed, weeks turned into months, and months into years. Our love kept growing strong. He became my go-to person, my gossip mate, and my best friend. But still, there was that anxiety and dilemma that I carried deep inside me. How was I going to share with this person about my decision? One year turned into two years. He introduced me to his family. The mentions of children dominated his conversations. We are strolling around the busy market. He sees nice baby shoes and he says, babe, I cannot wait to buy such shoes for our babies. At the supermarket, he sees baby diapers and he says, Babe, I cannot wait for us to include baby diapers in our shopping list. When we're making love, he says, Babe, I cannot wait for the time we'll stop using the condoms. And I knew this time will never come. But how was he to know that I did not desire the all idea of marriage and having children, unless I communicated. But still, I did not communicate. Not because I was questioning my decision, but because I was afraid of losing him. Four years down the line, one day, my phone rings. It was his, one of his friends, and he said, Susan, I have exciting news for you. And it is a secret. He's planning to propose to you on your birthday. This is, remember, this is a secret. So act surprised when that day comes. 
Talk of fear. Why will he want to propose? Why can't he sense I don't want to marry him? These and a million other questions ran through my mind. Determined to not let him go down on one knee, I started distancing myself from him. I did the only thing I could think of. I ghosted him. I ghosted him, hoping he would give up on me and find someone who aligns with his values. One month passed, and I thought, oh, this has worked. Two months, and my birthday passed, and I thought, oh, probably he has found a partner, he has moved on. Three months later, on a chilly Sunday, I was relaxing in my house listening to reggae music. I had a knock at the door. I paused the music, walked towards the door to see who it was. To my surprise, it was him. I had forgotten he knew where I stayed and he even had spare keys. For a minute I froze, contemplating whether to let him in or not. I finally decided to let him in. He walked straight to the coach, sat down, and asked me to come and sit beside him. He reached out for my right hand, held it with both his hands, and told me, Babe, I don't know what I've done wrong, and I'm not willing to give up on us without a fight. Babe, Let's talk things out and go back to where things were. All this time, I had not uttered a single word. Looking straight into my eyes, he said, Babe, I'm not leaving this place until you tell me what's going on. I knew this moment would come. Feeling cornered and tired of having to dodge this conversation every time. I finally decided to speak out, not from my mind, but from my heart. And I told him, babe, I love you. I love you so much. I just did not know how to tell you that I don't want to get married and I don't want to have children. With tears on his face, he said, why now? Why wait for so long? Why hold information we could have communicated from the start? He called me a betrayer and stormed out of my house. I felt numb. Well, my stand on not getting married and never having children still remains. But I have decided that I will always communicate from onset because I'm confident in my decision and I have full control of my body. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a powerful, powerful story, Susan. Um, I love the bit about kissing many frogs. I think we can all relate. <laughs> but really, really brings home just celebrating the power of choice and agency. And we really need to create spaces for every girl and woman to be armed with the information to, to do that for themselves. Now, we've really weaved through quite um, a few global issues just through storytelling. It really speaks to the power of stories. And I hope that it's made you think of your own story and, and how you can share it with the world and how you can use it to build community and bring change as well. You know, we really think at The Moth that when we equip women and girls with the tools that they need to really thrive, um, and when we trust them to make decisions and take control of their own 
um, care, we unleash a powerful engine for progress and everyone benefits from this. When women are healthy and empowered to plan their futures, families are better off, communities are better off, and societies are better off. Now we'd like you to keep the conversation going and share your thoughts from the stories that you've heard this evening. Which ones did you connect with? What story did they remind you of? And you can share that on social media. Just to remind you, the hashtag is ICFP2022, hashtag FP for all. And we'd love to hear from you as well. So make sure you tag The Moth too. We're on Twitter and Facebook, at The Moth. And on Instagram, we're at Moth Stories. And another thing that we'd love you to do, because we want to make The Moth family bigger and bigger, Share your moth experience with your friends and families so that they can catch the next moth main stage or even be one of the 100 million uh, subscribers and downloaders of our podcast. So if you want to know more about the Moth's global community program, remember all our storytellers and myself are graduates of this program and just trying to learn how you can get involved as well, just go to themoth.org. To wrap up this evening, I'd like to invite all our storytellers back on stage because they've done such a fantastic job. Suzanne, Roxana, Jasmine. Just come on stage for one final bow. Keep the, keep the applause going. They really do deserve it. Thank you, thank you so much for coming for this mock show and we hope to see you soon at the next ICFP.